Well, good morning. I am Pastor Jason, the senior pastor here, and we are in for a treat. For those of you who joined us the, the last couple days on Friday and Saturday, we had a, a marriage retreat in San Diego, and we, we had a special guest speaker, and Dr. John Street is here with us this morning as well. And for those of you who don't know, Dr. John Street is the, the head of the, the Biblical Counseling Department with the Master's University as well as at the seminary, and he was one of my favorite professors when I went through seminary, not only because he is a man of the Word, but because he loves Christ Church, he loves people. And time and time again, when I, when I went to his classes, in, in seminary, it, it, it was like heart surgery uh, upon me as time and time again, he'd, he'd take the truths from God's word and he would apply them to our marriages, to, to our, our, our parenting and to our everyday walks with the Lord Jesus. And, and as I, I was able to prod him to come and, to, and to lead us with the marriage retreat, by God's grace, he also agreed to come and to bring the word to us um, this weekend on this particular Sunday. So it is my pleasure and my, and my privilege, um, yeah, to welcome Dr. John Street. So please come up, brother, and share the word with us. Thank you, brother. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. We've had a wonderful weekend at the marriage retreat this weekend. It's been a real joy just talking with people, hearing some of the testimonies on how God worked throughout the weekend. That was just really great. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here at Rancho Baptist Church and to meet you as well. We are going to study the Word of God this morning, and if you have a pen and a little piece of paper, you may want to take some notes because I guarantee you at some particular point, you're going to need this in the future, or someone you know will need it, and you'll say, oh, I'm glad I took notes, all right? In fact, in our message today, I have four major points. That's all you have to write down, four major points of what uh, the Bible says about dealing with the question, is God punishing me? All right? I thought that that was a perfect message right after a marriage retreat because some of you are sitting there <laughs> saying, well, look who I'm married to. I mean, isn't it obvious? God is punishing me. All right. Well, grab your Bibles, would you please? Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 12. That's where we want to go. Our main text this morning will be Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. I wish we had more time where we would develop more of this chapter. We don't have that kind of time, so we're going to have to drop in, sort of um, look at these particular verses uh, very, very closely and... Um, Try to understand them within the context in which they're given. Follow along as I read, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Version here um, in regard to verse 7, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you were without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they, that is speaking of the earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness." All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Let's bow for prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for this wonderful passage of Scripture because it gives us insight into the daily details of our life and especially how your hands are at work in all of those details. I pray, Father, that you'll apply these truths to our hearts, help us to change for your honor and glory. 
in our thinking about you, what you're doing in our life, where you're taking us in the future. Help us to trust you. May our hope and our abiding faith be in you and you alone. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, over the past 45 years, I've had an opportunity as a pastor and as a professor and as a counselor to hear a lot of stories about people's lives. I've sat across the counseling desk from hundreds and hundreds of people. And sometimes people have sat there and poured out their heart and described for me what has gone on in their life with tears flowing down their face. And after describing all that was going on in their life, they look at me with all sincerity and they say to me, is God punishing me? You may have thought that. You may actually be thinking that this morning. Look at everything that's going on in my life right now. Look at this circumstance and this circumstance and look what's happening in our family and look what ha- what's happening with friends of mine and look what's happening at work and look what's happening in my home and I, I, is, is God punishing me? It seems like one difficulty after another just seems to come in. Why is that the case? Why am I having so many troubles? I want to answer that question this morning. I want to answer that question from the authoritative word of God. But before I do, I need to tell you a short, short story. And I'll make it short. It could be actually a lot longer. Every couple of years, I have the opportunity to travel to Switzerland and then go to Germany and train pastors that come from all over Europe. Back about 10 years ago, I had flown into Cologne, Germany, And there was a church there right in the shadow of the big United Nations building there in Cologne, Germany. Uh, It was actually a Russian Baptist church, and I was supposed to do a whole week of meetings. Myself and a colleague went in, and they were all pastors and their wives who came from all over Europe in order to get training on how to practically counsel and use the Word of God in people's lives. And the first day of that particular conference, we had been teaching all day. My colleague taught one hour, and then I had a break during his teaching, then I taught an hour, and then we'd switch back and forth. We broke for lunch, we broke for supper, and I had the last address of the day, which was 7 o'clock in the evening. So I spoke between 7 and 8 o'clock in the evening, and I had a translator who actually graduated from the Master's Seminary. And um, his name is Martin Manton. I don't know whether you remember Martin Manton or not, but he grew up in Switzerland, spoke German very fluently, actually spent his high school years in the U.S., so he spoke English very fluently as well, as well as French. And he's a big guy. Made me look small, and that really is something. He's a big guy, bald head, great translator. He's a fluid translator because sometimes I use translators different parts of the world, and they have to think in order to translate. He's not that way. I can just be talking just like I'm normally talking to you, and he just translates that fluently right into German, which is perfect. I love working with Martin. So we had been teaching that last hour. He was translating for me. At the end of an hour, I closed in prayer, and we dismissed people, and I was wrapping up my notes and putting everything together, and Martin was doing the same thing. And I noticed in my peripheral vision coming up the side aisle of the church, an older woman, probably between 75, 80 years of age, she had a long coat on, a scarf around her head, and I had my head down and I had my peripheral vision out like this. The first thing I noticed about her was how swollen her ankles were, which suggested congestive heart failure. And she came up and she grabbed my translator by the arm and she pointed a little bony finger at me, all right? And I'm ready to tell Martin, Martin, listen, tell her to come back tomorrow if she has any questions because I'm not responsible for anything I say after 8 o'clock in the evening. (laughs) And besides that, I was so tired after teaching all day that day, I could hear my bed calling me, John, come to me, 
come to me. I've missed you. You've been gone such a long time. So I was ready to go and, and, and sleep. And Martin turned to me and she said, he said to me, she wants to ask you some questions and she wants to tell you something she's never told anybody her entire life. <sighs> when a 75-year-old lady says that to me, okay, she's got my attention. Now you understand, she had been sitting in the back of the auditorium. There was probably about 200 people there. She has been sitting in the back of the auditorium that day, listening to all this practical admonition and dealing, using the Word of God to deal with practical problems. So Martin and I and this older lady went off to the side and got three chairs, and we sat down. I had prayer with her, and I said, what's on your mind? What, what do you need to share with me? And she began to share with me her life story. Now listen, after almost 45 years of ministry, I've heard some really bad, bad stories. Terrible stuff. But this is ranks up towards the top. This woman was born in the Soviet Union. She was born to Russian immigrants. Now, if you know anything about a little bit about your world history, you'll understand that back in the mid 1700s to late 1700s, Catherine the Great ruled Russia. After her husband, Peter III, had been assassinated, she ruled between 1729 and 1796. Or actually, she lived during that time, but her rule was 17, uh, 1762 to 1796. And Russia, during that particular time, in the late 1700s, was extremely impoverished extremely impoverished. And at that time, the best farmers in the world were German farmers. And Catherine the Great went to Germany, and one thing that Russia had was lots and lots of land. And basically said to German farmers, listen, if you come to Russia and teach us how to do farming... We'll give you huge plots of land you can have as your farms. Now, many of the farmers that were in Germany, because of, of the way in which the European system was, most of the barons owned the farmland. So these farmers were, were kind of like tenant farmers, and they had never owned land before. So this was incredibly appealing to these farmers. Tens of thousands of Russian farmers in the mid to late 1700s, left Germany, went to Russia, and even to this day, in fact, just a couple of years ago, my wife and I were right in central Russia, Samara, Russia, there are still German towns and German conclaves all over Russia from that immigration back in the 1700s. You can tell by the architecture. And this lady had been a descendant of some of those immigrants to Russia. And she grew up in a church where her father was the pastor. It was a church, now communism had taken over. And by the way, later on when communism took over, all those farmers and their descendants lost all their lands. Everything became the state, owned by the state. They lost everything. All their descendants, whatever they gained in moving there, they lost under communism. And she now grew up in the home of an, a pastor who pastored an illegal church of about three or 400 people. In fact, they met regularly out in the woods and that's where they had their worship service, in the middle of winter. 
She grew up, became a teenage gal, and as a teenager, fell in love with a young man that was a part of that church, too. One day, she was able to get away with this young man and spend the night with him. And in that one experience, she got pregnant, a horrible sin. When her parents found, find, found out about it, it brought shame upon them, brought shame upon the church. Um, it was a disaster. It was a disaster. Her parents didn't know exactly what to do with this. Since they were Christians, abortion was not an option. And back in those days, which is the early 1900s, very hard to get. And so her uncle came along and said, listen, I've got an idea. I can get her a job in another town. She can go and support herself until the baby's born. And then once the baby's born, give it up for adoption. And thereby, she can save face and return after she gives the baby up for adoption. I remember her telling me this story and looking me straight in the eye, and as she did, the tears that rolled down her face because the young man that she had been intimate with, she thought he loved her. But when he found out that she was pregnant, he abandoned the whole thing, took off. She never, ever saw him again. That crushed her. And you could see the anger in her eyes. She didn't like this idea about moving to another town, getting a job, supporting herself, then finally giving birth to the baby and giving it up. She didn't like that idea at all, but they didn't have any other option. And then she described for me the day that they took her down to the train station to put her on the train to go to this other town to get this particular job. Her, her mother, her father, her aunt, uncle, some of her brothers and sisters were there, and she was so incredibly angry at this plan, she refused to say goodbye to any of them. She got on the train and left, and that was the last time she ever saw them. She arrived in the nearby town, got off the train... A person met her there, and they took her to the job where she was supposed to, that her uncle had actually gotten for her, and her uncle had never described what this job was, but actually it was a job where she became a cook in a forced labor camp. She was a cook for over 500 men she was the only woman in the camp, and she had to prepare two meals a day for 500 men all by herself. And then she looked at me, and she began to describe for me how every single day, sometimes multiple Times a day she was raped. This was a living hell on earth. Nine months went by. She was walking into town in the middle of winter to get supplies for the kitchen. And the baby decided to come and she was all by herself. And she described for me how she sat down in the snow and she delivered her own baby, cut the cord. And you understand, this baby, from her perspective, was the reason for all of her pain and suffering. And she took that baby and threw it out over the ice. And the tears ran down her face as she's telling me this story. Through a set of circumstances, she was event eventually able to get away from that camp, move to East Germany while the wall was still up between East and West Germany. She got a decent job, met a guy. This time she got married. Not long after she was married, she got 
pregnant. When her husband found out that she was pregnant, he left her and she never saw him again. For the next 18 years, she raised her daughter. She grew up, met a young man, got married, got pregnant, delivered a granddaughter, and two months after her granddaughter was born, her daughter and son-in-law were in a terrible car accident. They were both killed, and the baby survived. And now she was left for the next 18 years raising her granddaughter. In the meantime, the wall between East and West Germany came down. And if you know anything about your history, people in East Germany were extremely po poor. They looked at the Western side of Germany as being the wealthy people, and everybody in East Germany flooded into West Germany to try to find jobs. She was part of that movement. She located in Cologne, Germany, which is part of of Western Germany, not far from the church where I was speaking at, she and her granddaughter, and her granddaughter began to attend the church that I had been speaking in. And through that experience, her granddaughter came to Christ, surrendered her life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And her granddaughter started coming home and say, Grandma, listen, you got to go to church with me. Not interested. Come on, Grandma, you got to go to church with me. Not interested. Grandma, please go to church with me. Listen, I gave up on church decades ago. I gave up on God a long time ago. Not interested in any of that stuff. But that didn't stop the granddaughter. <laughs> Grandma, come on, you got to go to church with me. Finally, Grandma said, I'll go to church with you once. Once. After that, I don't want you to speak about this anymore. And grandma went to church with her granddaughter, and in that one experience, God melted her hard, cold heart. She surrendered her life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That was just four months before we showed up. And I'm looking at my translator, and I'm looking at her, and I'm seeing tears stream down her face as she's telling this story, and I only gave you a thumbnail sketch because it took her well over an hour and a half to tell her story. A thumbnail sketch of her story, and I'm looking at my big translator, and he's got tears in his eyes, and every now and then as she's talking, she would lapse from German into Russian, and he would say, no, 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 say it in German, say it in German. All right, so I could understand it and I could translate it. And she'd have to say it in German, and as awkward as it was for her. And at the end of that, she looked at me and she said to me, is God punishing me? It's a great question, isn't it? Is God punishing me? I noticed she had a little Bible, and I said, listen, I want you to grab your Bible, and I want you to turn over to Romans chapter 8. Now, put a little marker here, just for a moment, in Hebrews 12. Go over to Romans chapter 8. She didn't know where Romans was. My translator had to find it in her Bible for her. Open it up to Romans chapter 8. In verse 1, I said, now I want you to read this verse out loud, Romans 8, 1. Now look what it says. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. She read it out loud, and she looked at me. And I said, do you know who wrote that? She said, no. I said, a man by the name of Paul. Do you know who Paul was? She says, I kind of do. I don't remember. I said, aside from the fact that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ, do you know that prior to becoming a Christian, Paul participated in the murder of Christians? The book of Acts is very clear about it. Paul was present during the murder of Stephen, the first martyr. I said, I want you to understand this. The apostle Paul, who's writing these words, 
himself was a murderer. I said, I want you to read it again. She looked at it, and then she looked at me, and then she looked at it, and she looked at me, and the tears formed in her eyes. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And then I flushed that out and explained it to her in terms of what it meant in terms of her life. Even with everything that had happened, even though she had murdered her baby, even all of that had occurred. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. None. And I said to her, I said, now tonight I want you to go home and memorize this verse and come back tomorrow and tell me exactly what that means in relationship to your own life, which, by the way, was a tall order for her. And she agreed to do this. We had prayer. To, by the way, it had been raining the entire day that day. She had walked several blocks in the rain in order to come. We made sure she had a ride home that night to her place. Next day came, I saw Martin in the hallway of the church. I said, Martin, where's our lady at? He said, I haven't seen her. And just then she comes bursting through the doors of the church, running about as fast as a 75-year-old lady can move with the biggest toothless grin you ever saw. <laughs> like that. And I, and I said, Martin, have her quote the verse. Martin says, she already did. Well, how'd she do? She did it perfectly. I said, well, then have her explain. What does that verse mean to her? What does that mean in relationship to her life? And she looked at me and tears formed in her eyes. And she says, I want you to know one thing. She says, For 55 years, I've carried this huge burden of guilt. And it's gone today. It's gone. This huge burden of guilt. It's gone. We stood there and just rejoiced, just rejoiced. Go back to Hebrews 12. I said there are four things I want you to see in Hebrews 12, verses 7 through 11. The first one is found in verse 7. Look at this closely. We're dealing with the question, is God punishing me? We're dealing with that particular question, so... Verse 7 says, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Now, a good way you can translate this is this. You are to endure hardship as discipline. That's a good way you can translate this. You are to endure hardship as discipline. What kind of hardship? Well, all hardship, no matter how small it may be, no matter how huge it may be, we are, to, we are instructed to endure hardship as discipline. So the first thing I want you to see, number one, first thing I want you to see in this passage, I must view all hardship as God's discipline. I must view all hardship as God's discipline. I must do that. Whatever it is that's going on in my life, no matter how difficult it may seem to be, I've got to view it as God's discipline in my life so that I know that God's fingerprints are all over what's happening in my life. I must endure all hardship, no matter how small, no matter how great it is, as God's discipline. This is really key. Why? Because this is the way that God works in our lives, isn't it? This is the way he works. Put a marker here for a moment. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And look at what God says about why he took the people of Israel through 40 years of desert wanderings, of difficult times. It was hot. They were always thirsty. They were always hungry. 
Why did God take his people through 40 years of that experience? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2. He says, You shall remember all the way which your Lord our God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandment or not. Now stop there. Now listen, listen carefully about this verse. It's really key that you nail this down. God was not testing them so that he could know what was in their hearts. If that was true, then our God's not omniscient. He already knew. He already knew what was in their hearts. He was not testing them so that he could know what was in their hearts. He was testing them so that they would know what was in their hearts. That's different. He was taking them through difficulty and hardship because they did not realize the depth of their own depravity and their pride in their heart. He had to show it to them. It took them 40 years. And sometimes I say to people that I'm counseling, I hope it doesn't take God 40 years to teach you your heart. Hopefully you're gonna be a faster learner. He took them for 40 years through the difficulties of a wilderness experienced to show them their hearts. He already knew their hearts. They didn't know that. And here's the problem. Listen, you think you know your heart. You think, and every one of us, we believe that our hearts are better off than what they truly are. We believe that. We think that. We think our hearts are better off than they truly are until all of a sudden God turns up the heat. God takes us and puts us right in the middle of a difficulty. Sometimes I say to counselees, I have a sponge in my hand and I hold my sponge out over my Bible and I squeeze that sponge and my Bible gets soaking wet. Why is my Bible soaking wet? And they roll their eyes and they say, well, because you squeeze the sponge. Dumb. <laughs> And I say to them, no, that's not the reason why the Bible's soaking wet. The reason the Bible's soaking wet is because the sponge is full of water. That's the reason why it's soaking wet. Why is it in the midst of a conflict between you and your husband, you and your wife, all of a sudden you, out of the abundance of your heart, say such mean, wicked things because God has put you in the crucible of that conflict to squeeze out of your heart what was already preexistent there. All of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth what? Speaks, right? Out of the abundance. So when the heart is under pressure, all of a sudden wicked things come out over our tongues. We say horrible, wicked things. God places you in that crucible, in that pressure cooker, and all of a sudden all of this stuff comes out. And we realize, oh my goodness, I can't believe I said that to my wife. I can't believe that I said that to my husband. I can't believe I said that to my mother, my father. I can't believe I said that to my children. Why? Because God has turned up the pressure and that pressure cooker has brought those things all of a sudden to the surface. Sometimes I go to a restaurant and I order hot tea. And the waitress will always bring out a great big box of all of this, every kind of tea on the planet. Yellow tea, green tea. And I always comment on how unpatriotic she was because our forefathers died for black tea, none of this other stuff. <laughs> it's only black tea in the Boston Harbor. That's all that was there. Only black tea. All right, that's all he wants, just black tea. Give me good black tea, I'm good with that. Don't give me all this other orange and pico and whatever you want to do. Our green teas, not interested in any of that stuff, like drinking hot grass. <laughs> I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in black tea. Now, when they bring it and they have different types of black tea, I can look at it and see who manufactured it, I can see, you know, what, where it 
the tea was grown, that kind of thing. I can sniff it to smell it. I don't know whether or not that's any good until I do what? I take the tea bag and put it in hot water, right? That's exactly what God does with your heart. God takes your heart and puts it in hot water, and then what seeps out is what is there. Every single hardship, every single problem, every single setback in your life is divinely designed by God to bring to the surface what is already preexistent in your heart. Wow. Why? Because God does this. He does this. He's an expert at doing this. Go over to Proverbs chapter 17. This is what God does. Solomon says in Proverbs 17 and verse 3, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests hearts. That's what he does. The Lord tests hearts, not so that he can see what's in their heart. He already knows. So that you can see what's in your heart. Because of our own pride, we think that our hearts are better off than what they really are. Go back to Psalm 119. Notice what the psalmist says in verse 67. Psalm 119, verse 67. He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You see, again, the psalmist believes that the affliction is God-designed. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Verse 71, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. So now his whole perspective on the hardship that he's going through is that it's good. It's not bad. It's actually good because it's purifying my heart. Verse 75, look at this. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. We have a tendency to think that God is being unfaithful when he afflicts us. No, no, no. God is being faithful when he afflicts us. He's not being unfaithful. He's being faithful. Verse 92, it says, if your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. So the word of God had to become my delight. Otherwise, this affliction would have crushed me. I would have perished. So the first thing I want you to remember is that I must view all hardship in my life as God's discipline. God is treating us as sons. We are to endure all hardship as discipline. That's the way a good, righteous father deals with his sons. There's a second thing I want you to know. Go back to Hebrews 12. Verse 8 and 9. Verse 8 says, But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of our spirit? of spirits and live. Now, first we said, I must view all hardship as discipline. But number two, I want you to notice this. When God brings hardship into my life, he's acting as a loving father. When God brings hardship into my life, he is acting as a loving father. Why? Because this is exactly what a loving father does. A loving father doesn't enjoy seeing his sons and daughters in pain. He doesn't do that. But he realizes that hardship and difficulty is a part of a maturing process. And God, who is the most loving father, understands the same principle that hardship brings about a maturing process in a person's life that we all need. So when he brings hardship into my life, he's acting as a loving father. Now, sometimes we as earthly fathers discipline our children for illegitimate reasons. We thought we were doing the right thing, but only to turn out later on, we weren't doing the right thing. 
Sometimes that happens. Now, I know as kids, you think that happens every time. But that's not true. In fact, the majority of the time, we do it for all the right reasons. Occasionally, fathers make it amazing. But God is absolutely sovereign. He's absolutely good and righteous in everything that he does. He never makes any mistakes. He's never made a mistake in all of eternity, and you're not his first mistake. You're not his first mistake. He doesn't make any mistakes whatsoever in relationship to bringing hardship into your life. He's not made a mistake with you. He knows exactly what it is. He's designed it for you, for your sake. This is really critical. When God brings hardship into my life, he is acting as a loving father. We can see this. We had earthly fathers, verse nine says, to discipline us, and we respected them. And we do. We're not talking about an abusive father or an angry father that's out of control here. We're talking about a good father that intends good towards his children. And that's the assumption here because God is always good. And if we respected human fathers who did it for the right reasons, shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? In other words, the righteous father in heaven, we need to be he says very, very clearly, we need to respect him even more for the hardship that comes into our life. This is really critical. So when God brings hardship into my life, he's acting as a loving father. You say, okay, I got it so far. I, I've got nailed down exactly what you're talking about, but you still have not answered the question, is God punishing me? All right, you ready? Fasten your seat belts and put your crash helmets on, Okay. Are you ready for this? Let's look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, For they disciplined us, that's earthly fathers, for a short time has seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. Now there we go. So number one, I must view all hardship as God's discipline. Number two, when God brings hardship into my life, he's acting as a loving father. Number three, I want you to see this. Listen to this. Verse 10 is very clear. This discipline is not punitive. It's corrective to bring about greater holiness in my life. All right, you see this? This discipline is not punitive. It is corrective in order to bring about greater holiness in my life. In other words, we're not paying for our sins. That would be punitive. How do we know that? Because Christ has already paid for our sins. We're not paying for it. We're not Roman Catholics who believe that, yes, Jesus died for some of our sins, but then we have to say the rosary. We have to do so many Hail Marys. We have to go to a confessional booth and confess sins in order to pay for the rest of our sins. For a Roman Catholic, only part of their sins are paid for, but for the true Christian, all of their sins are paid for because of the righteous sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his atonement on the cross. All of it is. That's the whole point of the book of Hebrews. Go back to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 says this. In verse 12, he says, but he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time sat down at the right hand of God. Now notice this. There was one sacrifice that is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for all sins for all times. There's no need to make any additional payments for sins no Hail Marys, no praying the rosary, no going to Mass. None of that is the case. All of this is done. It's completed by Christ. Praise God. Verse 12 says that. Verse 14 says, For by one offering he is perfected for all times those who are sanctified. One offering. He is perfected for all time. Those who are, and the, and the tense of the Greek word there, who are being sanctified, that is, being sanctified in this life. Positionally, we already, already 
declared to be absolutely righteous before God the Father because of what Jesus Christ has done. But in terms of practical sanctification, we are being sanctified to approximate what we've already been called to be positionally. That's exactly what verse 14 says. So we have progressive sanctification on this earth, but there is positional sanctification that we're aiming at what we've already been declared to be in heaven. All of that is key. You understand this discipline is not punitive, it's corrective to bring about greater holiness in my life. Now, why is this so important? I want you to understand the reason why this is so important is because if you were still paying for your sins, then you'd be in hell. If you were paying for your sins, you'd be in hell. And you may say, well, you know, I experience a hell here on earth, like I described with that lady. And that's true. Sometimes people have horrible, horrible things that they go through. There's no doubt about that. I'm not demeaning that at all. But if you really think that what we go through on this earth is equal to an eternal punishment of hell, you are horribly mistaken. We go through a lot of hardship, a lot of difficulty. In my past, I've gone through a lot of hardship and a lot of difficulty. And there are times at which I could have viewed this as, wow, this is just a living hell on earth. Now, not anything equal to what that lady went through that I described for you earlier. But in reality, it doesn't even come close to approximating the eternal hell and the punishment that Scripture describes So number one, I must view all hardship as God's discipline. Number two, when God brings hardship into my life, he's acting as a loving father. Number three, this discipline is not punitive. It is corrective to bring about greater holiness in my life. You can see that in chapter 12 and verse 10, where he says that we might share in his holiness. It doesn't say that we might pay for our sins didn't say that. That's why we say it's not punitive. It's corrective. Say, there's one more thing. You may be sitting there and saying, okay, I understand what you're saying. I get it. God brings hardship into our life. When he does so, he's acting like a human, or like a loving father. And when this happens, he's not punishing us but he is trying to perfect us to be more holy, more like his son, Jesus Christ. I got it. But how do I know? How do I know whether or not this has worked? How do I know it's worked in my life? Great question. It's answered in verse 11. Look at verse 11. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful yet to those who have been trained by it. Afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So number one, I must view all hardship as God's discipline. Number two, when God brings hardship into my life, he's acting as a loving father. Number three, this discipline is not punitive. It's corrective to bring about greater holiness in my life. And number four, listen to this. I'll know when this hardship has done its job because my heart will be at peace. I'll know when this hardship has done its job because my heart will be at peace. There will be a deep abiding peace that verse 11 says it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness that's going to be a part of my, I'll know it's done its job because I'll stop fighting God. I'll stop fighting him in my heart. God, why are you doing this to me? I'll stop shaking my fist in God's face and saying, you've made a mistake in my life. I'll stop fighting that. There will be no more angst in my heart. My heart's going to be at perfect peace. My heart's at perfect peace. That doesn't mean the trial and the difficulty has gone but you're at peace in that difficulty. You're at peace in that difficulty. 
That's really significant. So number one, I must view hardship, all hardship as God's discipline. Number two, when God brings hardship into my life, he's acting as a loving father. Number three, this discipline is not punitive, it's corrective to bring about greater holiness in my life. Number four, I'll know when this hardship has done its job because my heart will be at peace. A couple years after I saw Our Lady, I was back in Germany again. I saw her pastor, and I went to him, and I said, Pastor, how's so-and-so doing in your congregation? (laughs) He looked at me, and he said, I want you to know something. That woman is a spark plug. (laughs) I said, how so? Well, once a month in our church, we have an all-church dinner. It's a fellowship dinner. When we do that, and we have a church between three and 400 people, she doesn't let anybody into the kitchen. <laughs> None of the other women, no one else. She prepares the whole dinner. I said, well, you know, she learned that back in the Soviet concentration camp. He said, yeah, I know. That was her ministry. She had taken that horrible liability, and now that she was a Christian, she flipped it over and turned it to an asset. That's what the grace of God does. Taking that horrible liability that was a part of her past, flipped it over and turned it to an asset. Now she was ministering to hundreds of people every month. Every month. Jonathan Edwards, probably America's greatest theologian, while he was the president of New Jersey, College of New Jersey, which later on became Princeton University, upon his premature death, at least from a human perspective, it was premature, his grieving widow, Sarah Pierpont Edwards, wrote to their daughter these words. Listen to what she says. She was deeply crushed. She loved her husband. She said to her daughter, what shall we say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we may kiss the rod and lay our hands over our mouths. The Lord has done it, but my God lives and he has my heart and we are all given to God. What a perspective covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we can turn around and kiss the rod. Kiss the rod that just struck us across the back. The hardship that just came in. Spurgeon. In his message on Psalm 88 and verse 7 says, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I wonder if you've learned that in your life with your hardship. I've learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. When the rod of affliction has just struck you across the back, can you turn around and kiss it? Because you know that that rod is in the hands of a loving father. A loving father. One commentator says this, afflictions are as nails driven by the hand of grace, which crucify us to the world. Afflictions are then blessings to us when we can bless God for afflictions, whose single view in causing us to pass through the fire is only to separate the sin that he hates from the soul that he loves. That's the purpose of affliction, to separate the sin that he hates in us from the soul that he loves. So number one, I must view all hardship 
is God's discipline. Number two, when God disciplines me and brings hardship into my life, he's acting as a loving father. Number three, this discipline is not punitive. It is corrective to bring about greater holiness in my life to make me more Christ-like. Number four, I'll know when this hardship has done its job because my heart will be at peace. I will be taking all of my liabilities and I will be turning them to assets for his kingdom. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace in our lives. When affliction strikes us across the back, may we be able to turn around and kiss the rod because we know it's in the hands of a loving, good, and holy God. This we pray in Christ's name, amen. Amen.